According to the World Watch List 2024, 365 million Christians face persecution and discrimination every single day. That includes their homes and businesses being destroyed, physical beatings, rape and torture, churches being destroyed, church schools and hospitals being attacked, false imprisonment and, of course, murder. One in seven Christians worldwide face persecution, one in five in Africa, two in five in Asia, and in 20 2023, attacks on Christians skyrocketed, and all the predictions are that persecution against Christians is going to increase in the coming years. So this really is a serious issue for many of our brothers and sisters in the faith. And none of us, of course, are exempt from the threat of persecution in the future. And we need to pray for those people who are being persecuted and pray that God will prepare us for an uncertain future ourselves. But was all this prophesied in Revelation? Revelation chapter 11. Are you and I going to face persecution? Is there any hope for the church? Is there any hope for us? Well, welcome to the Faith in a Busy World podcast with me, Steve Griffiths. Now, there's a lot going on in Revelation chapter 11. It is jam-packed with teaching and metaphors and some quite complex images. But today we're going to unpack all of that and we're going to work through three themes in chapter 11. First, in the end times in which we live, the church is going to face increasing persecution. Second, during this time of persecution, our task is to continue spreading the gospel and witnessing to the power of God. And then third, at the end of this period of history, Christ will return, the faithful will be saved, and those who are anti-Christ will face God's judgment. So let's kick off with the first of these themes, the persecution of God's church in the end times, which we find in Revelation 11 verses 1 to 13. Now verses 1 and 2 say this, Then I was given a measuring rod like a reed, and I was told, Come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. The reed that John was given was uh, like one of those that grows along the Jordan Valley, which in those days was used by architects and surveyors to measure buildings. And John is told to measure the temple. Well, actually, in the Greek, it's the sanctuary of God. It's not the temple. It's the inner part of the temple, the Holy of Holies. Now, given the context, this is not the Jerusalem temple. It's a metaphor for the people of God, the church. Now, that's not an unusual idea. Paul referred to the church as the temple of God in 1 Corinthians 3.16, 2 Corinthians 6.16, and Ephesians 2.21. So there is biblical precedent for using the metaphor of the temple to describe the church. But why measure the church in Revelation 11? Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 2, we see that measuring in this way is for both preservation and for destruction. In that verse in 2 Samuel, um, it's about David's activity. And we're told he defeated the Moabites and made them lie along the ground where he measured them off with a length of cord. For every two lengths that were to be put to death, one full length was spared. And remember back to Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, where the church of God was sealed with these words, do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we've marked the servants of our God with a seal on their forehead. So I think that the measuring of the church is another metaphor for its preservation in the light of the seventh trumpet that's about to be sounded. But in verse two, we're told that the outer court is not to be measured because that had been given to the nations or to the Gentiles. In the Greek language, the word is the same for both Gentiles and for nations. So here's an interesting reversal of the physical reality, because at the temple in Jerusalem, the inner court was reserved for the Jews and the outer court for the Gentiles. But in this vision, it seems that there's a reversal of fortune between the two groups. The Jews are now in the outer court under the control of the Gentiles, and the Christians have moved into the inner court. So John challenges the view that the world is divided into Jews and Gentiles, and instead he divides the world into 
Christians and Gentiles. Christians, the church, is the inner court now to be measured and preserved. And the nations, the Jews and the Gentiles, will not be measured and preserved. Salvation is for those who worship God in spirit and in truth. We are not saved by any good works we do. We are not saved by our ancestral heritage. We're saved purely by the fact that we have submitted our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we've accepted his gift of mercy and forgiveness. We are saved by the fact that we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Our sins have been washed away by Jesus' blood shed on the cross. And so, as an act of thanksgiving, we give our lives over to the worship and service of God. Thank God for his amazing grace. And those who are not saved, we're told in verse 2, will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Well, why that time period? Well, it's a time period we come across many times in Scripture. Sometimes it's called 42 months, as it is here and in Revelation uh, 13 verse 5. Sometimes it's called 1,260 days, as in Revelation 12 verse 6. And sometimes it's called a time, times and half a time, a time being a year times being two years and half a time being six months as in revelation chapter 12 14 daniel 7 25 and daniel chapter 12 verse 7 and on all of these occasions when that measure of time is used in the bible it always refers to the period when those opposed to god will unleash their venom and their evil activities and it's also the same period of time that antiochus epiphanes person Executed the Jews in Jerusalem. So I think that John is saying that just as Epiphanes' persecution came to an end after a period of time, so the forces of Antichrist will not last forever, but they too, after a period of time, will be vanquished. So this is a message of encouragement for the early Christians and for us too, that as awful as persecution is and will be, it will not last forever. God's authority is greater than any persecuting government here on earth or any group of Christ haters. So during this time of persecution, what is the task of the church? What should we be doing in these end times? Well, John tells us God's words in verse 3. And I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. During this time period, we are to keep prophesying, keep preaching in the name of God. We are to keep sharing the good news of God's love, even to a world that increasingly rejects that truth. We must stay confident in the truth of the gospel. And that's why the church here is represented as two witnesses. It reminds us of uh, Deuteronomy 17 verse 6, which tells us that the testimony to truth is validated by the presence of two witnesses. And we are not surprised that this witnessing church in the end times is pictured as dressed in sackcloth because that's the symbol of mourning. And our prophetic role in these last days is to mourn the godlessness of society and speak hope into it. And then John adds in two more metaphors in verse 6 to describe the witnessing church in the end times. He describes the church firstly as two olive trees and secondly as two lampstands. And both of these images are found in Zechariah chapter 4. There's a link between olive oil and the Holy Spirit of God. So John is saying that the faithful church that witnesses to the love and the power of God in the end times is the vehicle for the outpouring of the Spirit of God on the world. And secondly, the lampstand metaphor reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world and our task as a church is to carry the light of Christ into the world. In Revelation 11, we have a beautiful and dynamic picture of the church in these end times. Yes, there is much persecution of Christians around the world. These are difficult days for many of our brothers and sisters, and we need to remember them in our prayers and advocate for their freedom. But persecution will not eliminate God's church. Revelation 11 reminds us that the church will remain faithful to God, reliant on the Holy Spirit for its continuance, pouring God's spirit out into the world and shining the light of Christ through 
it's worship and witness. We serve an almighty God and the truth of who he is will prevail and be proclaimed by his faithful children. And God's protection over his witnessing church in these end times is confirmed in verse 5. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. Now, we've got to be careful with this verse, of course, because it is just a metaphor. The fire is the message of the gospel, which is like a consuming fire of judgment for those who don't believe. When John writes, they must be killed in this manner, the word must indicates consequence. It's not a call to arms in the name of religion, but rather an idea that there is a consequence for those who reject the gospel proclaimed by the church. And in verse 6, the power of the prophetic gospel is outlined, and we're reminded perhaps of Moses' ministry before Pharaoh, whose heart remained hard despite the plagues and the misfortunes that fell upon his nation. They have authority to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Again, I don't think John is calling us to a literal interpretation of these words, otherwise we'd be called to acts of vengeance on the world. I think he's trying to express the power of the gospel and the metaphorical impact of rejecting it, just as the Pharaoh did in the time of Moses. But before we leave this idea and move on, we do need to acknowledge the reality and the serious nature of persecution, the sheer horror of it. Um, verse 7 of Revelation 11 is a tough one for us to get our heads around. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And that's the reality for the persecuted church, isn't it? The beast that comes up from the bottomless pit, which we saw when we looked at chapter 9, is political oppression to the church, and it does indeed conquer and kill Christians. So we are reminded that some Christians will pay the ultimate price for their faith at the hand of evil political regimes and that they will be treated with shameful disdain in verse 8. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Faithful proclaimers of the gospel in these end times may be killed and treated with disdain and made a laughing stock as their bodies are metaphorically left to rot in the streets. And the persecution of God's church will be a source of rejoicing for those who hate the gospel. Verse 10, the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and exchange presents because these two prophets have been a torment to the inhabitants of the earth. John is being realistic here. If the church is truly engaged in the task of mission in these last days, it will be truly uncomfortable and there will be casualties and the world will rejoice at these casualties. But... Praise God that verse 11 begins with the word but, because the persecution of the church is not the end of the story. It's not the end of our story, and it's certainly not the end of God's story. Revelation chapter 11 verse 11 says this, After three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. What vindication, what triumph for the church of God. What does Paul say in Romans 8? What can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or hardship, can persecution, hunger, nakedness, danger or sword? We have been treated like sheep for slaughter, and yet through it all, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. This verse in Revelation 11 is the ultimate encouragement towards the resurrection life. In these end times, the church may be persecuted to the point of extinction, the world may gloat, the world may treat us with disdain, but resurrection is ours in Jesus Christ, and the church of Christ shall never be overcome, because the Spirit of God, the reviving, resurrecting Spirit, is at work within us. And that is good news. There awaits for the faithful believers on earth a great reward in heaven. Revelation 11 verse 12. Then they heard a 
loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. Justification indeed. And after the removal of the faithful church from earth, as they ascend to heaven, the second coming of Jesus and the final judgment is announced. So let's move on to verses 15 to 19 and see what we can learn about that. Verse 15, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. The rebellion is crushed, evil has been overcome and now is the time for God to reign over his creation. In verses 16 and 17, heaven joins together in the worship of God and their worship starts off with a really interesting phrase. Verse 17, we give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who was and who is. Now, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because previously we've heard who was and is and is to come. But now he has come. And so the final part of that phrase has become redundant. Who was and is. And their worship continues in verse 18. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath has come and the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. The end has come, the final judgment is here, and the church will be vindicated at last. And we are left in suspension again at verse 19 as the day of judgment dawns, but we're not really given any details about it. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. And all I want to say about this verse is to draw your attention to the ark of the covenant within the temple, which is the symbol of God's presence with his people and the unbreakable covenant of his love that will never be destroyed that is eternal so even in the picture of the dawning of the last day there is a picture of encouragement for all believers that we are children of the covenant so during these last days before the return of christ we have a task to do to go out in mission and proclaim the gospel As we go, we are protected by God and we are assured that the time of tribulation is limited. We go out in the authority of God and the truth is that some of us will be persecuted, but we go in the power of the Spirit and we carry the light of Christ and no one can cause us ultimate harm. We may face political oppression and opposition and we may be treated with disdain and covered in shame and the world may rejoice at our failures, but ultimately we will be raised and we will experience resurrection and we will be taken up to the heavens with God. And we are sealed by the covenant love of God, which protects us from the horrors of final judgment. And that is surely a gospel worth worth proclaiming. So thanks for being with me today. I hope that exposition of Revelation 11 has been helpful and has given you real hope and encouragement for your own faith. And I look forward to being with you again soon. Bye-bye.